The history of our lives is simple. We are missionaries, and our time is spent bringing the gospel to the most remote, dangerous, and untouched regions of the earth. It was nearly 15 years ago these journeys started. We were young and full of life and setting out to make a difference. The first region we visited were the islands of the South Pacific and we called it our spiritual home because it was the beginning of our missionary endeavors. As the years passed, we traveled the world, witnessing miracles, seeing the hand of God in action, and seeing His truth abide in the hearts of those who have never heard of Him before. And we also saw the darkness of man, the wars, the death, but through it all we never lost sight of our call, the upward mark. And now with all this time past, we tend to think about our beginnings and have a yearning to go back to our spiritual home. So as we prepared for our next expedition, we knew the Pacific was calling us calling us back to our beginnings, calling us back home. Our plan was to start in Vanuatu and branch out to every nation near, preaching the gospel to remote tribes and those who were far from him. This was a mission about coming home, because home is where the heart is. just arrived here in Luganville and it's a small town you're looking at the map you know we're looking at uh, where we were in relation to all of the Spiritu Santos and um, and we're right in the main town area and this is you know nothing more than one street full of goods and supply shops and, uh, and that's pretty much it there's very little crime it's very you know very safe and nice people are always smiling to you always very very kind to you always want to help you in any way so it's very, uh, just a great, like, friendly little atmosphere that you find here in Luganville. It's only maybe 30, 40,000 people here. So it's a small island setting, and um, it's easy to get your way around. And what we're looking for right now, actually, is, um, is we're looking for a church that we can kind of hook up with. And this is what we do in every place that we go to. We're able to, you know, kind of come in, find a great... Uh, uh, church that's uh, that's on the same page as us and uh, and be able to find someone who can go back into the more remote and rural areas and uh, and see what kind of ministry we can put together so that's what we come here to Luganville to do and uh, we've literally just arrived and 
you know, taking a look at out over the small islands and the little channel that they have here. It's, um, it's quite a beautiful city and it's definitely got that relaxed island pace, that relaxed island vibe. You see everything shuts down here for almost, you know, three hours in the afternoon uh, because people are just taking a break. So uh, you have to kind of roll and move around on, uh, on island time. But, uh, but we're looking forward to the great days ahead and seeing what the Lord's got in store. Espiritu Santo is the largest island in the nation of Vanuatu, but with it only being equal to the size of Rhode Island, it can be driven from one side to the other in 90 minutes. Lush rainforests give way to untouched beaches, and stunning blue freshwater lagoons make a visitor feel like they're experiencing Eden. This is absolutely epic. One bonus with a small town on a small island is that everybody knows everybody. Very, very nice to meet you. And after asking around, we were told that the Assemblies of God was right down the street from our hotel. We called ahead of time and told the pastor we had stopped by and he was more than willing to help. Hey, hey, how you doing? All right. Thank you. Come in. Okay, thank Come you. In. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, been, I've been around here. I've been, so my ministry is planning churches. Mm. I plan all these churches in province. I've been serving the Assemblies of God for 34 years. Mm. When I was a young as a superintendent, young superintendent, I've been staying in uh, uh, Assemblies of God, uh, except for all my life. Mm. I still now. I'm still inside, but I'm, I really enjoy just to be a pastor. You know, go with people, cry with people, talk with people and then go out, bring the young people right at the same place. We plan on the church with the young people. My prayer that I want to see more revival coming through back in, uh, in Vanuatu especially. Mm. And a lot of our churches have been shipped back. And that's why I'm really thankful that a lot of uh, TBN is coming to, to help the ministries around Vanuatu. People have really appreciated yeah. the ministries. I'm, I'm one too. Yeah. I'm really happy with it. And for um, an inside in the interior, is it in like traditional wise? Is it uh, similar, different, or are they more than, like uh, like traditional habits? As we talked with Pastor Dick, we found a kindred spirit. He was a man passionate for the gospel and full of life. He was quick to smile and one to share his joy. <laughs> his explanation of how to minister in Vanuatu was exactly how we had operated everywhere in the world and encouraging to hear. Really go cool. talk to them, encourage them. And just like a Paul said, when I go to Greek, I have to just like a Greek, you know, that bring them up. When you go to Jew, it's like this. But when you go to Big Bay, in the area, so you have to go right where they are exactly. and bring them out. Yeah. You know, live with them, talk with them, encourage them, love with them in all just ways. Uh -huh. Like uh, if you want to kill the pig, you <laughs> eat like you kill the pig and roast the pig. Yeah. And then just like this in a big man, then from there you start to bring them in. Yeah. That be a part of it, yes. and put them in. Yeah, certainly. Pastor Dick told us that he would help us arrange ministry in remote areas and gather interpreters to join us. We were more than blessed to see things work out so fast, and we made a plan to meet for Sunday service and head out afterwards. In the meantime, as we waited for the pastor to make arrangements, we wanted to discover the history of Espiritu Santo. And for one of us, coming to this island meant that we'd be discovering some of our own family history. Amazing. This is the old uh, airstrip right here. This is kind of all that's left over. It's all grown over. You can see a bit of like uh, asphalt right here and then behind in the center section there. 
But this is where the uh, the old airstrip was in in Luganville in uh, in Espiritu Santo, and uh, this is actually right where my dad was uh, stationed, right along here. So it's pretty amazing, kind of thinking back how it must have been for him. He was young, 18 years old, uh, you know, just signed up for the Marines, going into war, and you know stationed here. And what a, a life changing event that is and what he saw during it and you know how it affected him. So coming here and seeing where he was during the war is real special for me. So what are these? My dog tags. You seem to be kind of scrambled up here. But but they are covered with cloth because uh, they wouldn't make a sound. The Japanese wouldn't shoot at you. Uh, so it wouldn't rattle around? That's right. How old were you when you joined? I was 18 when I graduated from high school. We traveled from San Diego across the Pacific and took such a long time because we stopped in, in places like Solomon Islands. In talking with my dad, you know, I've had a chance over the years to be able to uh, to talk to him about the war and kind of some of the things that he's, you know, seen and been through. And, you know, you can really tell how much it actually affected him. You know, you, you look into his eyes and you you know he's seen so much. You know he's uh, been exposed to much. And, uh, you know, what kind of takes me back and what I always think about, you know, how young he was at that point. I remember that there, there was a Japanese that was killed at our camp. He held this grenade on his chest and then pulled the pin and, and killed himself. Harry Carey. Wow. I remember feeling rather sick when I saw his, his body. While I was away from home, my mother put together this, this scrapbook. And, and all she had was some of my letters, but not many. Later on, she had photographs that I, I gave her. But all she could do would be to cut out the, the newspapers of the time. She just follow from your letters. That's right. Here's a here's a notice. What is that? A bit of Thai food. And this is dated October 15, 1945. And and my brother, my oldest brother, was was lost in a typhoon. And here's a picture of him. But, did you, but and how did you hear about that? I, I didn't know that until I came home. And I called up my family, my mother and father, and, and my father got on the phone and he says, your brother's dead, which I thought was rather rough. Did they say they're happy that she made it home or anything, or? No. It's just your brother died. Hmm. It's pretty amazing to kind of take in through his eyes what he saw. And, uh, you know, that's a lot of what you see on, in this journey. And traveling all throughout the South Pacific, it's kind of like that for me, because I always think back, I'm like, you know, what he may have seen or what he may have been exposed to. And it's been like that every time uh, in every area of the South Pacific. I always wonder, you know, what, you know, uh, looking through his eyes of, of, of that as well. Recalling the stories of his father stirred something in William, and he was now driven to see every piece of World War II history on Espiritu Santo, no matter the location. A day later, this brought us just offshore of Luganville to one of the largest wartime wrecks in the world, the SS President Coolidge. Yeah, we're coming up on the wreck right now. It's right offshore. 
pretty amazing because you can see all the buoys as they go out. Very far out. It's a massive ship. It's like 200 meters long. Here's the first buoy. Yeah, so basically what we're doing is tying off to the bow line. Straight down this way is where the bow of the Coolidge is. You can see way back there is the midship and then beyond that's the stern, but it's all in one piece, in it, which is quite incredible for shipwrecks. Usually they break apart and they're damaged, but this one's all in, uh, intact in one piece. We're gonna dive down to it right now and uh, enter into the ship and uh, look around through there. And it's pretty amazing because there's so much that's intact. I, you know, we've heard that you see guns, you see uh, the medical supplies, you see everything that's basically like it was left in uh, World War II times. Look how close it is to the shore. I know, you see right here. Well, the story is the, the captain hit a, a friendly mine and it was sinking and he just ran into the ground as far as he could and uh, everybody was able to get off there's only two people killed and then basically the whole ship just kind of slid down the, the coastline and then fell off into the edge uh, where it's sitting right now at about 60 meters so dive proofing uh, we're gonna go down and uh, explore it right now one small cut somewhere here get inside straight to promenade deck inside one small just one small cut soon straight to the bow Follow the thick line towards the face of this top. And then up. All right? Okay. Okay. One tank below me, one tank below me, one tank below me. Mm -hmm. Three times, three people. At 80 feet, the first sight you behold of the Coolidge is that of the bow. Laying on its side like a slumbering giant, its size and remarkably kept condition are beyond what we imagined. It's hard not to feel amazement and a nostalgic emotion for a bygone era, because it's more than just a ship at the bottom of the ocean. It's a view into American history, and for William especially, it was a view into his own family history. Working our way across the top side of the deck, we came upon armaments, shell casings for anti-aircraft guns still intact, M1 standard issue rifles crusted and frozen in time on the ocean floor. Each nook and cranny we explored 
yielded items that were more impressive than the last. Ones that were personal and made you think who might have used them. Now at over 100 feet below the surface, we looked for an entry point into the cargo hold and access into the bowels of the ship. The opening, which was nothing more than a small shaft, looked impossibly small to fit. But if one of us could make it, we all could. Inside, the bay stretched on and on as we swam down the halls that once held jeeps, guns, and trucks. As we reached depths of over 130 feet, we came to the barracks a place where men slept, ate, and lived as they journeyed into war. At over 650 feet, the Coolidge is nearly the size of the Titanic. Its endless halls and deck quarters were home to over 5,000 sailors, and due to its unfortunate sinking, it severely delayed the invasion of the Pacific Theater. The Coolidge is not a graveyard like the Arizona at Pearl Harbor, as all hands, except two people, safely made it ashore. But rather, it's a ship that is a time capsule and a museum of the World War II era. It is a view into history that few people will ever see. And to have been in it and see it with our own eyes was a special moment. At 40 minutes below surface and depths of nearly 140 feet, our air levels were running low. And after a few more passes through the decks, we began to make our way to the surface. Generations come and go, and our histories are written by the paths we take. During the war, it was a fight against tyranny, and those like William's father sacrificed much for the many. But now in our time, it is not a battle against flesh and blood, but a mission to preach the gospel to all mankind. But we are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God for a purpose and plan. And this mission is to speak of the completeness in Him. The life, the power, and how in weakness we are made strong. If we love Him and if we seek Him, His face will shine upon us. The cares and worries of this world will pass away and the light of His word will be our guide. We will enter His presence and see the beginnings of a revival.
revival. May it come, O oh Lord, may it come. And may your hand be upon us once again. May your spirit go before us, and may your word protect us. We give you glory for the life that we live. And we believe that the adventure ahead in this new land will be full of life in you. And we're going straight up into these mountains here. That's where the Koyo are. A lot of these villages around here have very strong beliefs in the volcano somehow. If you would like to receive a DVD of the episodes you've just seen, please go to TravelTheRoad.com or call 1-866-EXPLORE. Our mission at Travel the Road is to preach the gospel to all creation and encourage the church to be active in the Great Commission. The episodes we produce are with the sole aim to make an internal difference and to inspire a new generation for missions. To find out more about the ministry of Travel the Road or to order from our catalog of DVDs, please visit us at TravelTheRoad.com and together we can make a difference.